Um, thank you so much for joining us on our UCT um, Africa virtual ENC platform. Um, so this morning we have one of our uh, registrars presenting, Vivian Rania. She's going to talk to us about semicircular canal deficit. Um, if you wouldn't mind to just keep your microphone, microphones muted for the duration, it would be helpful. Um, and without too much delay, we can hand over to Vivian from here. Uh, we can see your screen well and you can start. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Divya and I'll be presenting on superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Um, this is a rare yet a very interesting topic. All my contents are referenced and there's no copyright infringement intended in the making of this presentation. Starting off with my case presentation, a 32 year old female presents to ENT OPD with chief complaints of a right low frequency pulsatile tinnitus for the past six months. She reports of autophony, that is she could hear her own voice at times, but no dizziness, headache, vertigo, nausea, vomiting, or hearing loss is reported. She has no problems in chewing, no bruxism, and neither reports of head trauma or exposure to loud noise. Her past medical and surgical history is nil and her social history she has no family history of deafness she's a non-smoker non-alcoholic with no tb contacts and is rvd unexposed on examination her right and left ear had an intact mobile tympanic membrane her nose examination was normal her oral cavity examination was also normal with a non pulsatile uvula and her neck examination showed no lymph nodes and no brie on auscultation of the vessels of the neck. Interestingly, on neck examination, on turning the patient's neck to the right, the patient would report that the tinnitus would stop. This is how her audiogram looked like. As you can see in the right ear, there is a conductive hearing loss over the lower frequencies rising to normal over the higher frequencies. Her left ear had a normal hearing. Her pure tone average and speech reception thresholds were within two to three decibels, and she had a good reliability. Interestingly, her tympanometry showed type A TIMPs. And what is more interesting is despite this conductive hearing loss over the lower frequencies, her acoustic reflexes were present. On tuning fork test, there was a negative renaise on the right and a positive renaise on the left. The Weber's test was in the midline. And when we placed the tuning fork over her right median malleolus, it lateralized to her right ear. At this point, we proceeded to book a CT temporal bone and order a full blood count, UNE and thyroid function tests. The differential diagnosis at this point was superior semicircular canal dehiscence, a high riding jugular bulb or a dehiscent jugular bulb, autosclerosis or a patchular cystation tube. This is her, an axial view CT scan temporal bone where we can appreciate bilaterally well aerated and well nematized mastoid air cells, normal ear ossicles, absence of a persistent stapedial artery, no bilateral vestibular enlarged vestibular aqueducts. And we could see that the jugular bulb on the right was slightly wider than that of the left. On coronal view, we noted that there was the normal two and a half turns of the cochlea, ear ossicles intact, no persistent stapedial artery, and here the semicircular canals seemed fine. But just on the right, we could see there was a little dehiscence over the posterior semicircular canal. Now on sagittal view, that is that of the left ear, where it's normal. We can appreciate here the posterior semicircular canal the superior semicircular canal, which has the bone covering intact. 
But as we proceed on to the right ear, we notice that there is absence of bone covering over the superior semicircular canal and over the posterior semicircular canal. Zooming in on these defects, here we can appreciate the superior semicircular canal with absence of bone, bony covering and the posterior semicircular canal with absence of bone covering. Hence, giving us the diagnosis of a right superior and posterior semicircular canal dehiscence. Now, as further investigations, we have ordered an uh, MRV for brain in order to view the venous sinuses and to rule out any intracranial pathology that could be contributing to both uh, these superior and posterior semicircular canal dehiscence. Now let us have a little review on the literature and how to manage superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal is in fact a recently, fairly recently uh, diagnosed uh, pathology in 1998 by Dr. Lloyd B. Minor and all from jo John Hopkins University. It is defined as absence of bone overlying the superior semicircular canal facing towards the dura of the middle cranial fossa. It in fact forms part of the third mobile window. As we know, the ear has the over window, the round window, but any pathology other than it leads to a third mobile window. And just a little review on what are third mobile window pathologies. It's not only involving the semicircular canal dehiscence, but it could also be a cochlear carotid fistula, a fallopian canal cochlear fistula, Paget's disease of bone, inner ear abnormalities in which the scala vestibuli opens into the internal acoustic canal, an enlarged vestibular aqueduct, and X linked stapes gusher. There are certain interesting facts about superior semicircular canal dehiscence. About a third to half of all cases performed on cadaveric and radiological studies, it has been noted that one side dehiscence can be associated with a contralateral thinning or dehiscence. And when we say thinning, it means it refers to a diameter of less than 0.1 millimeter. The age range varies from 27 to 70 years. Many patients have dehiscence but are asymptomatic. It has been noted that patients with superior semicircular canal dehiscence have higher rates of obstructive sleep apnea and higher body mass index, suggestive of a correlation between elevated intracranial pressure and the development of dehiscence. Patients complain of fatigue and the reason is because the brain has to spend an unusual amount of its energy to keep the body in a state of equilibrium while it is constantly receiving confusing signals from the dysfunctional semicircular canal. The etiology at times is unknown. However, there, there are congenital causes where there's developmental defect of the skull base. It could be related to head trauma or benign intracranial hypertension, it could be caused by certain infections, or due to age-related osteoporosis leading to bone thinning and systemic bony demineralization. Now, why the, what is the pathophysiology behind superior semicircular canal dehiscence? Now, this revolves around Ewald's law, which states that um, there are three laws, amongst which it states that the eye will move in the direction of the stimulated semicircular canal. Hence, stimulation of the superior semicircular canal will produce eye rotation in the vertical and torsional plane. Clinical diagnosis for this pathology is achieved by four main criteria. History and physical examination, audiometry, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, and CT scans. Coming to the symptoms, patients will report of fullness in the affected ear, a pulsatile tinnitus often described as whooshing sound, autophony, 
not only to their own voice, but sometimes they can hear their own heartbeat, their chewing, their footsteps or creaky joints. They also report of pulse-related eye movements and is sometimes described as blurriness. There can be hyperacusis, which is overtly sensitive ears to sound, and a low-frequency hearing loss. Vestibular symptoms are also reported, and this is sometimes manifested as chronic disequilibrium. There could be oscillopsia, which is perception of motion, often in the vertical and torsional plane. Now, Tullio's phenomenon is vertigo, which is evoked by sound. It is interesting to note that Tullio's phenomenon is not only seen in superior semicircular canal dehiscence, but can also be seen in syphilis, paralymphatic fistula, Meniere's disease, Lyme's disease, and cholesteatoma, and hence is, an, is important as differential diagnosis to rule these conditions out. Hennebert's sound, on the other hand, is vertigo evoked by pressure within the ear canal. And this is also seen in syphilis, perilymphatic fistula, and cholesteatoma. Vertigo can be induced by Valsovar's maneuver. Coming to tuning fork tests, so as I said, uh, placing the tuning fork on any bony, distant bony prominence will uh, lateralize the sound to the affected ear. And on audiology, typically a low frequency conductive hearing loss and a supranormal bony conduction threshold is observed. Sometimes the bone conduction can be less than zero decibels. A normal tympanometry is observed and there's presence of acoustic reflexes. There are six red flags of third window lesions that should alert us when we read an audiogram. These include low frequency conductive hearing loss with an otherwise normal hearing, bone conduction better than zero decibel hertz over the lower frequencies, presence of stapedo reflex despite a conductive hearing loss, dizziness on pressurization or dizziness on loud exp sound exposure, and Weber strongly materializing despite little asymmetry in the hearing test. Vestibular evoked myogenic potentials help in the diagnosis of superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Here we will observe the enhanced uh, vestibular evoked myotonic potentials. And what's interesting is, as we all know, there are two types of vestibular evoked myogenic potential, ocular and cervical. In ocular myogenic potentials, one would note an increased ocular amplitude. And with cervical vents, one would note decreased cervical thresholds. Eye movement, which occurs in the plane of the superior semicircular canal, is that ver is vertical and torsional. And it's interesting to note that this vertical and torsional component can be separated by having the patient to look to the right and to the left. In a paper published in 2017 titled Superior Semicircular Canal uh, Dehiscent Syndrome Lessons from the First 20 Years, a diagnostic criteria was uh, written down. And this include Firstly, a high resolution CT scan of 0.6 millimeter demonstrating the dehiscence. Secondly, at least one of the following symptoms consistent with the dehiscence, which could include um, Tullio's phenomenon, Hennebert's phenomenon, pulsatile tinnitus, and bone conduction hyperacusis. And then, thirdly, at least one of the following diagnostic tests which indicates a third mobile window. That being either negative bone conduction threshold on pure tone odometry, enhanced VEMPs, and elevated summation potential to action potential ratio on electrocardiography. Now, electrocochleography, sorry. Coming to CT scans. It is important to note that the high resolution CT scan cannot differentiate thinning from true dehiscence, as the positive predicted value is reported to be 57%. However, high resolution CT scans of 0.6 millimeter slice thickness 
reformatted in the Stenvers and Poschel's view, aid us greatly in diagnosing the superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Stenvers' view refers to an oblique coronal view of the petrous temporal bone taken parallel to the petrous temporal bone. And it basically gives us a perpendicular uh, image of, to that of the superior semicircular canal. In Poschel's view, it is an oblique sagittal view taken perpendicular to the petrous temporal bone that gives us a para parallel view to the superior semicircular canal. There are different clinical radiological classifications that are used to classify superior semicircular canal dehiscence. In January 2022, there's a new classification described by Stefan Waldeck and al. And this is based on the location of the dehiscence. Type one, the dehiscence lies anteriorly facing the middle cranial fossa. Type two, it lies at the highest point of the circumference of the superior semicircular canal. And type three, it lies posterior in the direction of the posterior cranial fossa. Of note, the most common type uh, location of dehiscence is that over the arcuate eminence. Now let us see how to manage superior semicircular canal dehiscence. We can opt for conservative and medical management. Conservative would mean to counsel patients to avoid triggers such as bending, driving, lifting heavy weights. We could counsel on vestibular rehabilitation techniques and tinnitus suppression techniques. We could prescribe hearing aids and give medications such as benzodiazepines, antiemetics, antihistamines, and tricyclic antidepressants. If conservative and medical management fails, then we can resort to surgery, and the option of surgery depends on the surgeon's skill. One can go for round window procedures, transmastoid approach, middle fossa approach, and endoscopic methods. Let us have a look over the surgical approaches. Now, each surgical approach has certain advantages and disadvantages. So seeing firstly the middle cranial fossa, the disadvantage is that it is an invasive approach. However, the advantage is we can directly visualize the arcuate eminence and the dehiscence and therefore carry on with our techniques of canal plugging, capping, or resurfacing. In the transmastoid approach, though less invasive compared to middle cranial fossa approach, there is no direct visualization of the dehiscence at times. Endoscopic methods are less invasive, however, still require temporal lobe retraction, and temporal lobe retraction can uh, give us epilepsy postoperatively. And coming to the round window reinforcement, this can be performed in outpatient setting, but however, the disadvantage is that it is of only short-lived symptomatic uh, improvement. Now, what are the different techniques we can use to repair the dehiscence? We can use canal plugging, canal resurfacing, canal capping, or reinforcement of the oval window. Now, according to it, meta-analysis in 2008, it was found that canal plugging had 97% success rate, canal capping had 93% success rate, but canal surfacing had only 50% success rate. So what do we mean by canal plugging? In canal plugging, we drill the dehiscence and open the canal further, and then occlude it with bone wax, temporalis fascia, proximal and distal to the dehiscence. The advantage of plugging the canal is that it provides relief of Tullio's phenomenon, Hennebert sign and autophony. But the disadvantage is that it could lead to global vestibular hypofunction, poor improvement of bone conduction, oscillopsia, and sometimes high frequency sensory neural hearing loss. Canal surfacing has a high failure rate. Canal capping, is refers to uh, resurfacing the surface of the superior semicircular canal using hydroxyapatite bone cement. Again, canal capping has a high success rate 
but is less successful in treating hyperacusis. And regarding round window reinforcement, we use facial graphs to of reinforce the round or oval window. The advantage is that it's less invasive, but the disadvantage is that the fascia tends to atrophy and leads to failure as early as six months after treatment. This is a diagrammatic uh, view of how uh, we can occlude the superior semiscular dehiscence via the middle fossa approach. Here we're plugging uh, the dehiscence using fascia or bone wax. In the transmastoid approach, we can plug uh, proximal and distal to the dehiscence. And in canal resurfacing and capping, and capping we can uh, layer fascia cartilage bone material over the uh, temporal, uh, petrous temporal bone. So one must be wondering which technique to use or which surgical approach is best. In an article published in 2016, a systematic review of 20 studies and 150 cases found that there is no significant statistical difference in terms of success rate and surgical complication between the various modalities and approach. Let us briefly have a view of how to approach by the middle cranial fossa. The middle cranial fossa is approached by using a curvilinear incision starting at the root of the zygoma, proceeding superiorly and posteriorly. The temporalis muscles being thinner posteriorly are, is cut in a direction opposite to that of the skin incision. The flaps are then retracted to view the site of the craniectomy. Now the craniotomy site is located by drawing a parallel line along the superior border of the zygomatic root and extending a perpendicular line from the midpoint of the external auditory canal. The intersection of these two lines is then used as location for the inferior border of the circular craniectomy, which is two centimeters in size. Manitol can be given intraoperatively to lessen the tension of intracranial content on the dura. Here you can appreciate how fascia is layered into the uh, superior semicircular canal, followed by bone chips and covered by bone wax. After bone wax is used to cover, we can then retuck the dura uh, to the inferior margin of the craniotomy site using 4O braided nylon sutures. The bone flap, which was removed, is then replaced and secured with titanium plates and the temporalis muscle is then returned back to its physiological position and sutured in place with three or chromic sutures. The transmastoid approach is an approach that is preferred by neurotologists. It avoids the need of a craniotomy. It does not involve temporal lobe retraction and it can lead to better stability of the canal plug. However, there are three conditions where one would resort to middle cranial fossa rather than transmastoid approach, especially if a patient has a low hanging dura or extensive tegment dehiscence. Secondly, if the opening of the superior semicircular canal dehiscence is close to that of the common cross, the plug could dislodge into the common cross, leading to sensory dysfunction of the posterior canal as well. There could be risk of trauma to the utricle and ampulla. And transmastoid approach requires drilling, irrigation, and suctioning, which could contaminate and cause serious labyrinthitis. How do we approach by a transmastoid approach? It's basically by doing a complete mastoidectomy where the mastoid antrum is identified followed by identification of ossicles and the lateral semicircular canal. The tegment tympani is thinned down using bi diamond burrs and exercising care to leave an eggshell of bone over the dura to prevent dural herniation. The superior semicircular canal is then identified using a two to three millimeter diamond burr over the anterior and posterior crura until a blue line is visible. Now, in the technique of Agarwal and Pauls, the anterior and posterior cura of the superior semicircular canal, once identified, is then carefully eggshelled 
and the thin bone of each cura can be fractured inwards on itself, obliterating the anterior and posterior crust. Coming to round window procedure, this is, as I told earlier, done by using fascia, perichondrium, or muscle, and was historically used in perilymphatic fistulas. The aim of doing a round window procedure is to obliterate and eliminate the third window effect. The world is now moving towards endoscopy and underwater endoscopic ear surgery technique helps in preserving the inner ear function, reduces thermal effect of endoscope and provides better magnification and visualization. The endoscope eliminates the limits, in fact, the intraoperative intracranial pressure changes and helps to reduce postoperative seizures. It is interesting to note that we can, one can use tragal or conchal cartilage for resurfacing. The advantage of using this is twofold. Firstly, the cartilage is pliable enough to conform to the undulating surface of the floor of the middle fossa. And secondly, it does not block or plug the lumen of the semicircular canal. All operations come with complications. And some of the complications include here vestibular hypofunction, transient or permanent sensory neural hearing loss, CSF leak, meningocele, temporal lobe retraction, facial nerve paresis, and pneumolabyrinth. In a paper in 2021, uh, seeing the revision surgery outcomes, it has been found that post-operative symptomatic resolution was 100% for headaches, oscillopsia, 80% for autophony, but the least corrected symptoms were that of hearing loss and vertigo. Before I end, certain interesting and uh, challenging questions regarding superior semicircular canal dehiscence. What should we do if there is bilateral superior semicircular canal dehiscence? Radiographically, one can see the presence of bilateral superior semicircular canal dehiscence, but it does not warrant intervention if there's absence of symptoms. If we have to address, one can go uh, for an interval timing of six weeks to six months between the cases. One must confirm that both ears with the canal dehiscence have localizing signs and symptoms and are supported by the diagnostic criteria. One must determine if there is a worse ear and address the worse ear. One must rule out comorbid factors such as migraine that could prolong recovery. And it's very important for us to counsel patients that there is a lower rate of complete symptomatic resolution with bilateral superior semicircular canal dehiscence. And in fact, there could be sequ uh, sequential repair of this dehiscence can lead chronic uh, balance impairment, especially noted in patients who have undergone surgery bilaterally. They have a higher risk of vestibular hypofunction. What should we do in pediatric patients who have superior semicircular canal dehiscence? Children often present with uh, delayed onset of walking, hearing loss, and radiographic appearance of this dehiscence in children younger than three years is in fact consistent with normal development and should be handled with observation. Conservative treatment is favored in children by use of hearing aids and operation is only reserved for the intractable vestibular handicap. What about near dehiscence syndrome or thinning of the bone of less than 0.1 millimeter? Ward and all and Baxter and all demonstrated that near dehiscence patients had the significant post-operative improvement when they underwent the same surgeries as that performed for superior semicircular canal dehiscent patients. Hence, one can proceed to do the same operation. And what about revision surgeries? for superior semicircular dehiscence. Now it's been found that revision surgeries are less successful in resolving symptoms and improving quality of life. Sharon and all in a study of 21 patients found in fact that a third of patients experienced complete resolution, but that the risk of sensory neural hearing loss was high. 
patient and uh, surgeons prefer to use a different approach when doing a revision surgery. But it all boils down to uh, discussing with the patient before giving them a revision surgery on the benefits and pros and cons. Lastly, future considerations for um, tackling the problem of superior semicircular canal. One could eventually in future fabricate 3D reconstructions and prevent third mobile window phenomenon without the risk of disease recurring or persisting as has been seen with canal resurfacing alone. This is a nice flowchart which summarizes how we must approach and manage patients with superior semicircular canal dehiscence assessing the audiological symptoms, the vestibular symptoms, considering differential diagnosis and excluding them, and then proceeding with audiometry, CT scan, uh, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, and then going on for our conservative management, medical management, or surgical management. These are my references. Thank you for your kind attention. Are there any questions? Thanks, Sylvia. That was really great. Um, I don't see any questions from uh, people that are joining us from outside. Any questions from the team? So just to say, Sylvia, that was an outstanding presentation. You, know, you really summarized that. You can hit like myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Well, do you have any questions? Um, maybe a moment on, um, I think we'll go back to the case presentation. Um, the positive tinnitus that resolves with head turning, it's not, like, if I remember correctly, it's not typical of, 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 of superior semicircular canal disease. It's more typical yes. of um, venous causes of uh, of Yes, that. absolutely. That's why we've ordered the MRV just to see the sinuses. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then I think it also came out. I think later the stain was and post few. I think that's very important if we interpret in the CT scans. Um, um, to to just not you know interpret them based on the coronal views or mm -hmm. cytotop views, et cetera, to, to always interpret them in the plane of the, of the uh, same secular canal of consent. And then um, in addition to that, I think the issue of tinnitus, um, I don't know if it's maybe the Thomas was any studies that look at the outcome of positive tinnitus in these uh, uh, surgical approaches, whether it's surfacing or plugging. Because most instances, what I think I remember is the tinnitus it, it was poor outcome in terms of the tinnitus, it doesn't really resolve. So one has to be careful in, in terms of patient selection for surgical candidates, because if, if, you, if, you, if the chief complaint is the tinnitus, one may, you kind of have to be realistic with your patient in terms of the outcome. I'm not sure if they came across uh, Yes. That. Yes, it showed that um, tinnitus had only 50% improvement. So it's 50-50, um, they can either resolve or it could persist. Yeah, they, that would mm. yeah, be realistic in terms of, of, of patient's expectation if, if their main complaint is tedious. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. I think so, that, uh, so the on the call. So do you have any comments about this in children? Okay. Sorry, so you can unmute yourself now. Do you have a comment? No, it seems that's all that's just there. Okay, well, thank you very much. I thought that was an outstanding presentation. I look forward to seeing it on the YouTube channel so that we can review it. Thanks, Tavia. That was fantastic. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you.